Well, now you can see why we brought Dr. Nash here. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed that. We're going to take questions. We're going to bring, if you'll raise your hand, we're going to bring a mic to you so that everybody can hear your question. Banu Symington, a physician and a fellow Philadelphian, David. We knew awesome. each other 30 years ago. My goodness. Proud to be a medical oncologist, the leaders of evidence-based medical you care. You bet. You bet. But we're not too good at, com we're still trying to incorporate comparative effectiveness in our, in our practice, so cost of care. You didn't touch much on the patient role because right. you know patients come in to me asking for Provenge. Right. We have patient satisfaction surveys. If I say no to Provenge, right. they say, I don't want you. I want that other doctor in Boise who said he'd give me Provenge. You didn't give me that MRI I wanted for my back. I'm exactly. going to Dr. Smith. You won't give me antibiotics. I'm going to go to Dr. Jones. Right. How do we engage the patients in responsible yeah. financial behavior? comparative effectiveness research? Yes, yeah, a great question. So um, I, I knew I would get this question. I, the fact that it's the very first question is awesome, and it shows that people are paying attention. So yeah, what about the patient's role in all of this? And great, that Provenge slide you know, hits home, and it does induce demand, there's no question. So how are we gonna calibrate patient involvement, patient decision making, especially with folks who are ill? Well, it's a very unclear area at the moment, you know. Um, so the Cleveland Clinic is uh, one example. You know, they won't hire anybody who smokes. Uh, you can't be fat and work there. Constant drug screening for drug abuse. That's on the employee side. On the patient side, it's incredibly complicated. Typically, what we do today is it's all economic incentive. You want that MRI, that CAT scan, no problem. Here's the $500 copay. So I'm pretty confident that Charlotte Nash never would have gotten the first CAT scan had she had a $200, $300 copayment. Never would have done it. Uh, we're doing that with uh, drug tiers. There are plans with four, five, and six tiers, you know. So we're going to use economic incentives to drive changes in patient behavior. Now, will that work when patients are really ill? You know, I don't know. I don't think anybody really knows the answer to that question. But there's even a more sophisticated question in there about uh, patient consumer satisfaction scores. So um, as board is probably aware, your CAP scores are going to be figured into your reimbursement, right? So at our place, we're worried about the noise, uh, free parking, which is huge. At our place, 13 different doctors are in and out of a typical Jefferson Hospital room on the average four-day stay. Who's my real doctor? They talk too much in the hallway. I mean, we've heard it all. Um, you know, how important is all of that to really drive a change in outcome? Well, all I can tell you is we've put an economic incentive on all of that, and now we're looking at noise in the hallway, no talking, no more overhead paging, nothing going on at night. So we're not there yet. Summary. Patients are going to pay more if they want stuff out of the narrow network and out of the narrow benefit structure that they have paid for. And you and I, at the bedside, in the office, are in part going to be the arbiter of that process. And it's not going to be fun. So it's not a great answer. It's an incredibly complex problem. Incredibly complex. I guess one more thing I'll just say for board members. So there is a national movement, not in cancer, but in primary care, called Choosing Wisely. You've heard of this, of course. It was a New England Journal of Medicine editorial a week ago. So the American College of Physicians in Philadelphia has this national effort to get primary care doctors to engage in a conversation with patients that no, you don't need that EKG, you don't need that pre-op screening, chest x-ray, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in the absence of an economic incentive to really engage, I I'm not sure that really is going to be successful. Got a lot of press. It's a step in the right direction to have the conversation. But you know, when little Johnny's mother wants that augmenting for his sixth ear infection, the root of less resistance is to write the damn prescription, right? And that is the challenge we've got. So great first question, supercharged area, supercharged area. I would say, David, just in closing, you know, engaging with your own associates, and we're trying this in a rudimentary level, um, I have seen over 24 years our own benefit structure whittled and whittled and whittled down. I mean, you could barely see the piece of wood now we started with. 
And if God help you, you get a prescription filled outside of our own apothecary, you're going to pay an exorbitant thing. Did it change behavior? Certainly changed the Nash family behavior. No question. Yep. And I went from, like everybody else, Nexium to Omeprazole as soon as I could. 50 bucks versus 10. So, you know, will it work for everybody? Probably not. Will everybody be happy? Probably not. But we're going to act this out in, in, you know, every office in the country. That's a great question. Great, great question. Jim Everett, I'm a board member here at Treasure Valley. And uh, first of all, great presentation. Thank, Thank you. You. Uh, you talk about patient-centered, and, and I wish we'd switch that to people-centered, because I think that mm -hmm. just even the language, you talk about 15% of the, 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 right. the solution is resides in doctor's offices and hospitals. Right. How Great. do we push this from a policy standpoint Great. to where people are people and not necessarily Excellent. already patients? So Great. So let me put my Humana hat on. So it's all about members, not patients, right? So what are we doing for the member to keep her healthy? What are we doing for the member to get her data when she needs it? So we never talk about the patients, all about member benefit and member behavior change. So great, we hear you on the private sector, no question. Because no, no, you don't want to be called the patient when you're the customer, right? You're the member, you're in the family, you're part of the process that we're gonna go through. Yes, yeah, so I hear you loud and clear. Uh, it's hard for us, you know, for doctors, this is a very complicated area. You know, even calling someone a consumer is very difficult. You know, when you're trained that that's the patient, they're the patient. Let me tell you a great story. Again, you can't make this up, so you know. <laughs> so Rachel Nash is in her third year of medical school. It's a year ago. She's on, must be her second rotation. So she's been in the hospital roughly three months. So she calls home. She's all upset about some patient-related things. She says to my physician wife, I could barely do it without a straight face, you know. She says, Ma, in my clinical experience, <laughs> so you know, the doctors know exactly what I'm talking about. This is year three, the first six weeks of year three. Where did she get that from? Answer, in the water. In my experience. You know, we had a, hoot, a whole night over that one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, seeing it up close and personally, her own daughter, 35 years later, I, you know, I, I couldn't go to sleep. <laughs> right? In my experience. Then you want that person to lead a team 20 years later and allow everybody to function up to their level of their license and coordinate and take feedback and do a 360 and do what every business person board member knows innately not going to happen. That's the problem. John Miller on the system board. Again, appreciate your time here. Thank you. It's been fascinating. To put this in a little perspective, when you quote that we're 17th in the world mm -hmm. in healthcare, and I've heard similar numbers from others, you, you know, you find, and you listen to all these issues we're coping with and dealing with, you find it a little unbelievable to think that some of these little poor countries right. are dealing with the kinds of things we're talking about here right. better than we are. I right. mean, you can see how they may do it cheaper than we do, but to think that they're doing it better blows your mind. Sure does. And then from everything I know, anybody around the world, if they're sicker than hell, the first place they come is here. They sure. Don't, they don't go to Latvia to get right. fixed. So do you, do you believe that context? Yeah, great question. Yeah, it's almost, uh, you know, it's almost un-American, right? I, I get it. So dollar for dollar, pound for pound, on a population basis, hands down, that report is correct. Now, if you needed spinal fusion surgery, like I did 12 years ago, I'm going to go to the best place in our great country to get that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the 85%. So in nations that pay for child care, in nations that abhor violence, in nations that can't tolerate half a million children in their founding city, going to sleep hungry every night, that's the issue. So you're right. So it's not the hospital care per se. That's correct. It's the 85%. Right. So, you know, I'm not going to get into is it a red or a blue issue. You draw your own conclusion. 
let's not forget, in the 21st century in our country, we have the greatest wealth disparity of any nation in history, right? It's not the 1%, it's the 0.05%. Now, I'm not saying that robbing Peter to pay Paul will fix it, not my point. Does wealth disparity contribute to poorer health? The answer to that is overwhelmingly yes. That's our problem. Have a question over here. Thomas Huntington, I'm a uh, surgeon and a board member. My question is basically about physician extenders. Yeah. And your example of your mother is, is very nice. My specialty is esophageal surgery. Yeah. <laughs> and I know that there are actually very few primary physicians in this area that will order a CT scan for a hiatal hernia. Good. Not quite true, though, with nurse practitioners' PAs, and I see a lot of that. Hmm. This is something that we really have transformed in the last few years. A few yeah. years ago, St. Luke's basically didn't let a PA, NP do anything. Very much part of our mainstream health care. What's happening there? Is this actually going to make things better? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, sorry that you have those folks ordering inappropriate tests. So what's the research evidence show? Well, let's put it this way. Um, Walgreens and CVS and all of that wouldn't have invested hundreds of billions of dollars in a nurse practitioner-driven primary care system if they thought they were doing a bad job, number one. The research evidence from the best places, Columbia Nursing School and elsewhere, published in the New England Journal, what does it say? These folks, PAs and NPs, do it better and cheaper than primary care doctors, hands down. I mean, that's the research evidence. Whether you got folks who are outliers ordering tests here, they're inappropriate, you know, could be, I believe you. But the research evidence is, um, from a doctor perspective, disconcerting, I guess. Uh, from a public policy perspective, right on. You know, let's do it. Um, the teamwork, so again, you know, going back to my deeply held belief here, it's all about the team. So then you need a physician team leader who's trained as a leader to effectively utilize everybody's skill set. So I blame that inappropriate test ordering on whoever the leader is of that center or place where the doctor is titularly in charge. Somebody isn't doing his or her job. So take home message. Research evidence, hands down, these people do a great job. That is the take home message. Now we could quibble about the test ordering. Does it happen? Sure. But the research evidence is overwhelmingly positive with regard to NPs. I thought you were going to ask me about, you know, typically I get the doctor of nursing practice. What's that about? Calling them doctors. And oh boy, you know, it's exciting stuff. We got a big DNP program on our campus, and they like to be called doctor. That's complicated, you know? Can they do it better and cheaper, no outcome, no income? Well, if they can, the marketplace will reward them, you know? A couple of years ago, again, in Kansas City, we, when the Minute Clinic and Take Care were starting and I got to go, this was fun, the Kansas City Medical Society invited me to come and defend retail medicine. So, you know, I wore my blue Kevlar bulletproof suit. <laughs> and I just started by asking them a couple of kind of diagnostic questions. Who's on at night? What time do you open in the morning? Do you do email with patients? Do you do a follow-up phone call? Are you on an electronic medical record platform? Oh, and do you post your fees online? Then it was pretty quiet after that. <laughs> so, you know, I get it. Do we have, do you have another question? Let me ask you uh, from your Humana experience. Um, first of all, what's their philosophy? Who, who should be doing population management, health management? And second of all, uh, to whatever ex degree they feel the provider community is essential in that, how are they transitioning or transforming to enable them? Wow. Because we <coughs> talked about yeah a lot of the things that need to happen that there's no payment for. Great, okay, so again, you know, I'm a board member, so I'm gonna give you 60,000 feet, but right. do the best I can. So, Humana definitely believes that they should drive the population health agenda. 
by engaging with patients. So there's the intake, phone call, nurse visit, uh, inventory of the home, wellness, exercise, incentives. It's all about member engagement, number one. Number two, on the clinical side, the model is get as many Humana members into a managed care setting as possible. And you could call it HMO, ACO, whatever model, but in a prepaid model and put the providers at economic risk. Why? The research evidence is overwhelming. You and I know that's what changes behavior. Because if you incent the provider to provide prevention and wellness, that's what they're going to do. And so where appropriate in certain markets, we're buying practices who know how to do that. So there is a little bit of owning the means of production. We don't really want to do that as much as we could, you know. We certainly don't want to own the bricks and mortar, right? right? Too expensive, uh, not agile. Uh, the other thing Humana is committed to is physician leadership training. So you're a new Humana physician leader, you're in a very, uh, a robust training program to learn all of this. And come this summer, Humana is launching its internal leadership training program on population health. So David, no surprise to a guy like you at the top. It's a, all over, top down, bottom up approach, but let's not kid ourselves. They are economically aligned to make all this work. And they're gonna put the resources behind it to do it, you know. Uh, so, one of the challenges I think we're going to have, and nobody's asked me yet, is this business about the narrow network. It's like nobody ever heard that word before. Mm -hmm. The only way we're going to make this work is to build a narrow network with great providers like St. Luke's who are going to practice based on the evidence, measure what's right, do the right thing. We would love to be your partner if you could do that, right? And if anybody else can't do it, we don't want them. And then we've got state legislators telling Humana and others, no, 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 you got to take any breathing provider, I call it. You know, it's a little, it's a little out there, but not meant to be disrespectful, but if we do that, we will never fix what's broken, right? Never. That's what got us in the jam in 1999, 2000, 2001, blow back against the gatekeeper model, any breathing provider, oh, we're back to where we were in 1965. You know, if you can't hone to the evidence, you should not be in the network and you should be penalized, period. Is it going to make everybody happy? Uh-uh. Definitely not. That, you know, so, oh boy. I've got one more question in, uh, before lunch, unless there is a question out there. No? Okay. Oh, right here. Uh-oh. The last question between now and lunchtime. <coughs> and he's this sitting is, in the first row, so I'm worried. This is the guy that I always dread at every meeting I do oh, when God. I take questions. So <laughs> here Okay, you go. good. Fire away. David, thank you. I consider that a compliment. Excellent. <laughs> I enjoyed your presentation, too. Thank the you. question that I have for you is that you have identified that 15% of our clinical stuff is evidence. Yet you Grade can, A evidence. Yes. Yet you still... Uh, drive us on evidence base, and so the question then becomes, what constitutes evidence, and who decides? Yeah, great question. Because okay. if you if you look on the national level, sure. from the guidelines where eighty five percent of it is expert opinion, right? The experts are wrong more often than they're right. Correct. I'd be the first. All right. So first, let's define great question. Great question. Let's define the terms. Then I'll answer your excellent question. So when I said 15% is based on grade A, uh, so grade A evidence, randomized controlled trial, grade B, non-randomized controlled trial, grade C, observation data, you know, series, grade D, barely passing, is expert opinion. So you're totally right. So when a senior attending tells my daughter, in my experience, I tell her, head for cover. <laughs> okay, so as long as we agree, that's the definition of evidence. Now. Here's St. Luke's and Jefferson's challenge. You know, are we going to have all the right data at the right time for every decision? Uh-uh. So here's the size of unexplained clinical variation. What I'm suggesting is it's our professional duty to shrink it. How much? That's your culture. I can't tell you. 
But if you're going to allow any doctor to order Provenge whenever they feel like it, well, that's not good medicine. If you're going to allow any primary care doctor to admit without a consult to any ICU in any place you work, that's not good medicine. If you're going to, you get where I'm going, right? So it's your culture has got to figure out what it is you're going to measure because you're only going to improve what you decide to measure. If heart failure is important to you, well, there's a ton of evidence about how we ought to treat heart failure. All I'm suggesting is variation is so great, let's cut it in half. Make that a governance goal. A governance goal. That will get traction, right? Because that variation is deadly and expensive. Deadly first, expensive second. Will you all help me thank Dr. Thank David you. Nash? Thank you. Very well done.